say a, a few things about your experience um, with text-based games, and then we can go from there. Um, Phoebe, do you want to start? Okay. Hi, I am uh, Phoebe Barton, she, her. I am a queer trans writer. I My experience in text-based games is that um, I wrote the game The Luminous Underground with Choice of Games. Very many words, very much text, and it was a finalist for the Nebula Award last year. Last year, yeah. Yeah, I've completely lost track of years. Uh, Stephen? Uh, I'm Stephen Grenade, he, they. I am a physicist and writer and have written uh, a lot of indie text adventure choice-based games um, set on spaceships, set on Earth. One time a fun game about having dementia. Um, I've won a couple of XYZZY awards for that work, uh, which is an interactive fiction specific award. And my upcoming game, Professor of Pattern Magic, will be coming out uh, from Choice of Games, hopefully later this year, as I furiously shovel more words into that particular steam engine. Excellent. And um, Anne, um, if you can go next. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Anne LeBlanc, uh, she, her. Uh, I'm a writer and woodworker. Um, my interactive fiction, flash fiction story, uh, The Coffin Maker, uh, won uh, Sub Q Magazine's uh, Reader Choice Contest and was published there. Uh, and I'm very excited to be here. Excellent. And I don't know if our host is still around for tech, but we have an email from Tenacity. Um, Stephen, the host, are you still there? Maybe not. I okay. am, yes. Yep. Okay, uh, would you mind? I just have an email from Tenacity saying they don't have the panelist password. Um, I don't know if you have their email, but if you can. Um, if there's someone who can kind of get that to them, that'd be great. I think everyone is having yep. trouble with the panelist password. Mm -hmm. it, yes. yep, it feels like it's been a recurring problem. I will, um, yeah, I will look for their email. I don't see them on Discord right now, but I will. Um, yeah, I just have it. an and email. If, if they're not on. Okay, if you wouldn't mind replying just because I don't see them in Discord, and I'm yep. not sure if they have their email, just asking them to make sure they're logged into Discord, I'll definitely be looking for them there. Yeah, yeah so you could su you could suggest that they try logging in as a uh, uh, attendee, which is I think what I did by accident because it didn't ask me for a password. Uh, okay. And then the right. well, if you see me if you see me typing, you'll know why. <laughs> so I'll get everyone started on uh, on things so that I'm not uh, taking up too much time with this. Um, so um, maybe we can start by talking about um, different formats of games and what some of the options are and, and some of the pros and cons of the different formats and, and styles of text-based games that are out there. Um, and do you want to start with that? Um, yeah, I mean, the that's something I've been interested in is, is looking at how um, the, the engine or the technology that you're using to write these games affects the types of stories you can tell. Uh, for example, like a, a Twine game um, or story is going to have a very different feel than um, say choice of games, um, particularly because uh, Twine allows you to have a, a lot of um, freedom within the text to have different hyperlinks leading to different little you know sub nooks in the story, uh, and you can do you know loops very easily. Um, whereas with choice of games, um, they've got to focus on on stats um, and kind of uh, you know it, in in some ways it's more game like or it brings a lot of um, uh, systems from games. Uh, and then of course, I, I've used um, Inkle's uh, Ink tool, um, which I, I really love. Um, it's, it doesn't seem to be quite as, as popular in um, the IF scene from what, I've, from what I can tell, but um, that allows a huge amount of freedom uh, almost too much because you can get into some really complicated, like, you know, like there's a whole programming language under there that you can really do uh, really fancy stuff because they use it for their uh, their regular games. Um, Inkle does, um, so it it's quite powerful. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm curious what people. Nice. Oh, hello. Hi. Got it. And sorry about that. I had trouble finding. No problem. Glad you made it. Excellent. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, so we, we've gone around and done our introductions and uh, Anne was just uh, talking about um, different formats of text-based games and what some of the options are out there. Um, so um, do you want to go ahead and Tenacity and tell us a little bit about you and the kinds of games that, that you've worked on? Yeah, um, I'm working on a visual novel that's a sequel to Night in the Woods right now, if you've played that. Um, it's like made over a discord. Um, I wrote kind of this like TTRPG scene where I kind of like have the characters in the game play a game. It's going to be fun. Um, there's a Twitter for it if you want to like follow the details. I'm like a huge fan of Night in the Woods. So, and then I'm also making this really huge and possibly like, like, I don't know, impossibly complicated twine game, um, where I have like many different characters and, um, many different routes. And it's possible this is my infinite jest. Amazing. Thanks. Yeah. Excellent. Um, Stephen, I know you've worked on uh, Choice of Games uh, with Choice Script, um, as Phoebe and I have as well. Um, what other kinds of text based games have you played around with at all? I, so there's just a tremendous number of tools. One of the things that I really like about the different communities that have formed around interactive fiction is how many folks have created incredibly high quality tools and languages and ways to create these things. Um, and they have like different approaches and different strengths. Um, I, you know, I started out doing old school text adventures like, you know, Zork way back in the day. And so you've got a, a form seven that is a programming language, but really is sort of text first. Um, and you're interacting with the world typically through typing, which is a very different field than the choice space where you're clicking links. But even then, using something like Twine that is boxes that you tie together with arrows so you get a very visual view of the, the sprawl of your story, I engage with that differently than I do with, say, Choice Script or Ink, where it's a text file with indents, so it's more like a, a traditional programming language. And I don't know, my brain sort of approaches that differently. Or then if you're going to use something like RenPy and do a visual novel, like that again has a very different feel and the added uh, typically graphics on top of that, um, that go along with that, that just do something different in my brain, I guess, when either I'm playing them or trying to create them. Do you want to talk about um, anything that you play around with or uh, what the pros and cons are? You were, were you talking to? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cause, yeah. Because I, I couldn't uh, hear a lot of that. But um, could you actually repeat the question so I can make sure I understand? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. It's probably my, uh, my internet uh, popping in and out there. Um, yeah, I was just asking whether you've played around with different formats, uh, or if you want to talk a little bit about choice script and what some of the pros and cons of that are. Well, I have, um, what I was trying to do, like, it's something I had to put on the back burner a bit because this has been a time after, uh, Luminous Underground in, uh, choice script, I wanted to start learning twine, but I think part of, um, part of the thing is like, I was still approaching it from a very choice, choice script mold. And like one of the things I kind of wanted to do was I want to be able to also have some kind of, for lack of a better word, stats that can endure throughout the game and be manipulated throughout it and have an effect because some of the, th a lot of them, the twine game, the twine game interactive fiction that I've played, some of that felt a lot to me like pretty much just a straightforward linear pro story put into twine and i was looking for a way to add, to add on to that but it's something i'm still i'm still wrestling with and need to get back to just because it is very much its own thing yeah, for sure. And it reminds me, I was I was uh, troubleshooting at the beginning of the panel, so I forgot to talk about what I've written in interactive uh, fiction. And um, I've also written uh, two games for Choice of Games. Uh, one of them is called The Magician's Workshop, which is set in Renaissance Florence. Um, and the other one is called The Road to Canterbury, the road with uh, one Geoffrey Chaucer. Um, and uh, yeah, and so for those of in the, in the audience who don't know, 
um, Choice of Games is a company that uses ChoiceScript, which is a, a language um, that allows writers to um, uh, to write their story uh, with sort of minimal programming language, uh, just to um, uh, you know, sort of an interface between the back end and and the narrative part of of writing the game. Um, so um, uh, we want to talk a little bit about um, getting into this as writers and where we come from. I had no programming background at all, except for learning some basic uh, back in the 80s. Uh, so I can do like, you know, run and go to um, and a little bit of HTML. Um, but I came to, to this very much from a, a writer's side and I've always been a, a gamer as well. Um, what was everyone else's background and what drew you into writing text-based games? Um, let's start with uh, Anne for this one. Uh, yeah, so I was actually um, a programmer out in the Bay Area uh, doing that whole um, startup scene. And I, I left that industry, um, but I, I did miss some of the more creative aspects of, of programming. Um, but I think what really got me into uh, wanting to write interactive fiction was playing um, Inkle's 80 Days uh, and seeing how, just how amazing the, the writing uh, was there uh, and, and that giving me ideas about things that I, I might want to do. Um, with, uh, with with the tools available. Excellent, um, Tenacity? Yeah, I'm basically a straight up writer. Uh, I went to film school and focused on screenwriting and then I kind of like went to prose and now I went to games. Um, I really love Porpentine Charity Heartscape though, who is a queer disabled uh, text adventure maker uh, who kind of like plays with taking choices away from people in games to highlight like like lived experiences that some people have. And I love that. I love everything Porpentine Charity Hardscape does. Um, so that kind of like inspired me along with Dune to start kind of like noodling around and twine. And then I had some comp sci skills from college, but then yeah, a lot of it has just been like Googling a lot of things. Uh, and Phoebe, do you want to talk about your background before you came into uh, writing interactive fiction? Yeah, um, I was just again, a prose writer, mostly short stories. Um, essentially, no programming experience except like 10 print, go to hello world, 20 go to 10. And uh, it, one thing that got me, it did, uh, it did provide a lot of possibilities that you can't get in linear fiction. And that's one of the thing that, things that uh, drew me toward it. And one of the things that I'm still wrestling with in trying to find, figure out, like, is this thing that I'm thinking about good enough for to be covered as interactive fiction? Yeah, we can talk about the ideas and and how we um, how we build on them too in a minute. Uh, Stephen, do you want to talk about your background? I don't think I asked you about that yet. Uh, I definitely came in closer to, to Anne's um, as a kid in the 80s, playing with computers, like text adventures were a thing that was around. Graphics weren't as prevalent. And so I like my parents got me this book about, you know, program a text adventure in basic. And then in the 90s, um, you know, I later got to college and discovered the Internet. And there were communities of people writing these text adventures and creating tools for it and really trying to thrash out well, what do these games look like as, as works of art? Like at one point there was a big old argument about, well, if you're playing a game, you're really playing yourself. You're not playing a character. How could you be somebody different? And that is completely flipped around that so many more people are now comfortable about the idea as you're experiencing a story is that it is a character that you are guiding and potentially inhabiting that is not you, that there is that separation. But there was like, big arguments about that. I just find the the art form fascinating in terms of the breadth of expression that you have with it, um, with the dialogue between like the game mechanics and the author and the player. I, I just, after all these years, I still find it super fascinating. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. One thing I'll, I'll mention for, for you know, people coming into or interested in getting into IF from a non-programming background is that I almost feel like having a programming backward background can be a handicap because you come in having a bunch of expectations for 
you know, how things are done either in a functional or object oriented uh, 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 perspective. And then, you know, what you're, what you, the tools you're using are, are very different from that. And, um, you know, are similar to some of the, the uh, kind of very, very high level languages that, that might be built on top of like Ruby or, or, or JavaScript. And that there's a lot of uh, magic going on under the hood and a very narrow set of things that you can do with the tools. And if you try to go outside that, you're going to be in for a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. But that also means yeah. that it's much easier for people with non-programming backgrounds to pick up. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I was, I was glad about that because I didn't have that background and, um, you know, so, uh, it, there was a bit of a learning curve for sure, uh, trying to write, uh, interactive and, and think about a story in that way. Um, but, uh, you know, it wasn't a huge learning curve on the technical side, uh, for me. So twine, I'm still, uh, my, my twine efforts are still pretty, uh, <laughs> you know, 101, but, uh, I'll get there. I think twine is, is cool because you can pick it up and play with it right away, but, uh, to, to make it look really good and to do what you want with it, um, I think takes a, a bit of practice, or at least so it seems to me. Um, that was really interesting what you said about like second person like perspective um because i mean in the world of fiction the second person is having such a moment right now with like carmen maria machado i'm so used to like picking up a narrative and being like okay i'm this you're the boss author and i mean wasn't dungeons and dragons a thing where people used to play in characters in like ttrpgs at least like it is still a thing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, totally definitely a every week in high school like as someone who came from interactive fiction into prose to see people like, oh, I can't read second person. You can, you know, you can't tell me who I am. I'm like, our community kind of already went through that and figured out like, no, no, we can roll with this. And so it's interesting to watch some corners of the, the prose world sort of go through and recapitulate some of those discussions. Mm. Yeah, one thing that I found really interesting in interactive fiction coming from a prose writer perspective is that, um, different players I, th I think um interface with their with their player character differently so some people for example don't like to play a character that would make moral choices that are not something that they would do so some some characters want a choice not to drink for example or um you know not to murder someone um and coming from a prose background that was a little bit alien for me because to me it was like well i'm just writing a character the character is not you um, but when you add that interactivity into it, um, it, uh, it does create that other dimension for a, a lot of players that um, there's more intimacy between the character and the, and the player. Um, so what were some of the other things that, that people uh, had to sort of adjust their thinking on? Uh, you know, Phoebe, coming from a prose background, how did you find that transition into writing interactive? It's still, it's something I'm still struggling with, working with too, but like originally, it was a case of just, I wanted to offer as many choices as I, as I could reasonably think of. Like, and not, not limit to, like, not, not artificially limit a player's choices based on what I felt like. And the whole, I think the whole um, choice of games, use of stats in choice script does really help with that because there are those ways to personalize your character in ways that you can see and also track and also ones that uh, because there are also things that can affect how the narrative unfolds but being able to see like it's not about it's not about the numbers go up but numbers changing means that you that a player can have a much more immediate just reminder that yes the choices you're making do actually make an impact what you're the what you're doing actually does matter in this context and i think that is the the biggest uh, the biggest issue just make, making sh making sure that you make it clear to the play to the player that they are important they matter this choice is not worthless this is not a choice for the sake of making a choice. This affects something late, later on. And sometimes it's one of the things that I wrestle with is whether or not am I starting off by, by forcing a player 
into a choice that uh, or like into am I forcing the the player to make a choice just by starting the game that they may not be that comfortable with? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. How does everyone else balance that uh, tension between giving the player agency and guiding the story? Anyone want to jump in on that? Well, for, for me, coming from a, a short story background, um, the, the, the whole idea about choice was really freeing because, you know, coming up with a satisfying ending in a short story, especially when you're constrained for space, is really, really difficult. Um, and so writing interactive fiction, I'm now in a space where I can have, I don't have to pick one ending. I can be like, okay, well, here's, here's three, here's five. Um, and, um, you know, when I'm doing short um, uh, interactive fiction, really my, my, my goal is to have every choice or, or as many choices as I can um, really be um, connected to that ending and the kind of thematic arc of, um, the, uh, of the story uh, and the emotional core of it. So I try to re reduce the number of choices that don't, um, that are just kind of like, okay, here's, here's some options for dialogue, but it doesn't really matter which one is like, when, when you break the narrative for choice, um, I want to have it be something that is meaningful um, to that ending and to that narrative arc. And of course, that doesn't work quite as well in longer um, uh, formats, like, like say a cho choice of games game. Yeah, sometimes you do need just those sort of color choices or, you know, like fun choices that don't really affect the narrative. But but even with choice of games, yeah, that um, there is always this feeling of like bringing it back into consequences and, and making sure that it's a coherent arc for sure. Um, anyone else want to jump in on that? Um, and then I'll go back to Phoebe because I think I see a, a hand. Yeah, I guess, I mean, it's kind of like quantum storytelling, right? It's really interesting to just see like how, yeah, uh, all the possibilities and timelines can kind of just break up and sort of just examine the same set of choices from every angle that a person could take through it. That was my main point. Yeah, I had sort of the, the opposite experience in that a lot of my indie games have been you inhabiting a more defined character. So there are still choices happening, but you're less defining what the character is rather than sort of exploring a smaller constellation of possible actions defined by that character who already kind of exists. And I really had to kind of shift thinking when I started to work on the choice of games because it is so much, so much of that audience is interested in defining how the character is as well as what they do. Um, and I also will stand a little bit for reflective choices, uh, like meaning doesn't just have to be reflected in the game world. You can also give players a chance to say, this is how I feel about what just happened. This is me expressing my emotional or moral thoughts about the events of the story. And that gives them a chance to feel seen in, in ways that I think are really powerful. I, yeah, I feel like Kentucky Route Zero did a great job of giving those kind mm -hmm. of like those kind of choices. Definitely. Um, Phoebe, did you have something to, to jump in on this? Yeah, it's just, it's something that's come up and especially just in regard to the choices, like even the th sort of things like color choice, I think it's still very important to make those things like personalized and unique because one of the things I've noticed like, it, and it's something that really, uh, hang on, just fixing where my camera is, looked like I was looking offside. But one of the things that uh, you have to be careful with, especially in some, uh, some programs, is how much the player can see into the workings. Now, this isn't really much of an issue in uh, choice of games games because the mechanism with which uh, a player is experiencing the game, um, you would have to go to some effort to actually get the raw text files that show like all of the all of the guts and stuff, but things like Twine, like some Twine games let you go back and like take a different different path immediately. And that can expose things like for one example, like the idea of a Twine game where, and part of it is you're choosing what to wear to this soiree and what really 
made me feel kind of down was discovering that no matter what choice I made, it went to the exact same text. And so the game was telling me right there, your choices don't matter. And I think that is, it's very much something you do not want the player to see that in a in an interactive fiction game, unless that unless that is the point that you're trying to make. But this, I feel like this is the sort of thing that can unintentionally creep in. Yeah, absolutely. There's, um, uh, you know, you can you can use interactive fiction to make choices to, to make a point about lack of agency for sure. Um, but I think a lot of the time we are trying to expand that sense of agency and and um, and give that to the player. Um, and yeah, a great example um, of a of a story that does that is um, the Marriage Variations uh, by Monique Laban in uh, Tiny Nightmares. Uh, and it's actually a, um, it, it's entirely text, but it's in the format of a choose your own um, adventure game. Um, and it does something fascinating with having the, um, the, the choices loop back on each other and then tying that uh, to the themes going on in the story around being trapped in this kind of awful uh, relationship. Uh, so sometimes there's really interesting stuff you can do with that that lack of agency or, or showing the, uh, the, the kind of the strings underneath. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this, this is a potentially big tangent, but, um, I'm blanking on the name of the Netflix project that won the Nebula a couple of years ago. Bandersnatch. Um, Bandersnatch. Thank you. Yeah. Which also did something very similar with agency, um, you know, not to spoil, but it, it was very much about that sort of limiting, um, the sense of agency. Um, I have one other question I want to ask, but I do want to just remind the audience that they can um, ask questions in the chat. So if you have a question, please do put it in the chat and I will, um, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but Anna wanted to come back to you um, on the, um, on the question of pacing and how um, pacing differs between interactive fiction and, and linear prose, um, which does really key into these things we've been saying about choice. Um, how do you think about pacing when you're writing uh, interactive fiction? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, coming from a, a short fiction background, like pacing is super important there. Um, you know, if you don't, if you don't keep the uh, the reader's interest uh, in the first, you know, couple pages, uh, and if you don't keep things moving, uh, it's just not going to work. And and one thing I find interesting about uh, interactive fiction is how the pacing um, differs, um, because it kind of has a kind of almost staccato um, rhythm to it where you've got a chunk of text, uh, but then it stops um, and uh, you've got a choice. Um, and it, it kind of reminds me a little bit of how in short stories, you'll often have um, section breaks um, that are used to, uh, you know, uh, change a scene or, or even for, to, to give emphasis to the end of a paragraph. Um, and so, uh, when you're in an in interactive fiction, um, when when the narrative stops for a choice, um, that kind of uh, gives added importance to the to the last bit of of text that you read or, or whatever came right before that. Um, and, and it also, you know, when you know when we talk about like when do you give a player a choice? If you, I feel like there's an expectation in interactive fiction to have um, uh, choices fairly frequently and that you can't have like several chapters uh, where they're just reading and reading and then you get to a choice. Like you need, you know, you, you know every couple paragraphs or so, um, you, you need a choice. And I, I, I'm curious if, if people have experienced um, uh, works that uh, break those, those conventions or, or, or done interesting things with it. Well, one thing I notice in Twine is like sometimes you'll make a choice and then like for pacing sake, it'll go to like a one screen that's like a single sentence. It's like, you know, like you're knocked out, like, and then, you know, you wake up in the next pa panel. Um, just to slip something in there about choice. I think like being an anarchist influences my relationship with the players of my games a lot. Like, I think I think a lot about not just like the fact that I think people should have all the choices, but then the fact that we usually don't have very many. Um, and I think like 
the meaning of like what choices you take away like with Corpentine Charity Heartscape, as I mentioned before, um, she made one game where like basically you're locked in a room and all you can do is eat an energy bar and shower. And that's like <laughs> society. Um, anyway, yeah, that's the whole yeah. thought. Yeah, I think there's a lot of, of ways that you can play with that and a lot of interesting works. Uh, I was trying to think of uh, Porpentine Charity Heartscape's game where you were encouraged to draw on your skin. What is what is the name of that one? It will come to me in a bit. Yeah. Um, but where you were making choices and also interacting with your own physical self that I think is really neat. Um, twine, really a, a lot of twine works have experimented and pushed on what your interaction is clicking. So what can that do? So you'll have like cycling text where the word is, or phrase is highlighted and you click and it changes to something else and you click and it changes to something else. And it is sort of revealing other things within the text um, and allowing you to kind of either experience an ongoing thought process or sort of choosing a variation of what the, the text meaning is. Um, I think about uh, Michael Lentz's My Father's Long, Long Legs, which is this uh, horror story in twine that is long passages with very little choice but is very affecting um i think about like the the rhythm of those interactions and not just choices um the the game that i wrote will not let me go about the man with dementia i wanted to have you experience the stutter step of searching and trying to figure out what am i thinking of and so sentences just stop halfway through with a link and you click and it continues and you've not made a choice, but you've had the experience of I get to something and I've got to do some action to bring up the next bit of thought. Um, so I think there's a, a lot of, of space in there to play with. What does it mean to interact with text? Yeah, like at risk of I, I don't want to like be taking up too much of the space in this conversation, but I'm writing kind of a story in the form of a personality quiz, basically in Twine. So like it, when you take a personality quiz, you answer, but then you don't really know what effect that has for your results. And I think part of it is like the player is making choices, but they don't know for like much of the story exactly how that affects what they see next in the story. Mm -hmm. That's like, oh, have, me. have any of y'all played Catherine Moriarty's um, Human Errors in Sub-Q Magazine? Mm, you, I don't think I have. you are a uh, QA person, uh, who's trying to clear out all these bugs for this uh, device that a company has sold. And as you go through the story, you kind of figure out more about what that device is and how sinister it is. And you've got the corporate expectation of clear the bugs, clear the bugs, clear the bugs, don't interact with the people, but the stories are heartbreaking and it's presented as sort of a Bugzilla style QA form. And I just highly recommend it as something that is choice constrained by interface and design and yet just packs a huge emotional punch at least for me what was the name of that again human errors by yeah. Catherine moriarty in sub q magazine oh man i miss sub q magazine i'm so sad they're not around anymore yes shout out um so we have a question in the chat which is uh hopefully not too embarrassing but what is a mistake that you want to keep others from making um well i mean i think that the first thing that i think about when i think about um lessons learned <laughs> with joy script is certainly um the uh the tendency to balloon right so um the th one thing about interactive fiction is that um you any small choice even a piece of dialogue or you know three lines of dialogue a different conversation can require then you to write you know several thousand more words and then um so if you don't think really carefully about that, uh, you can really um, spend a lot more time than you wanted to and blow your deadlines. Not like I ever did that. Um, anyone else want to talk about that or other lessons learned or mistakes that you won't repeat? Yeah, Phoebe. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I had a very similar experience to that because I did blow a deadline because it was a case of I have 120,000 more words to write. I physically can't I'm incapable of writing that much in a month but and also during the plague but um one big thing is knowing where it's ending up because part of the i guess part of the 
problem with mine is that I only had an extremely vague vague idea of where it was going. It was it ended up working out because the idea I had was solid enough that it was able to take shape while I was writing it and I was able to steer toward that. But in terms of like if you read my outline and then played the game, you would be able to see like how quickly the outline diverge or certain how quickly the game diverges from the outline and that by the end there is essentially zero com zero commonality and you can like end up spinning your wheels a lot or taking way more much more time than you expect because of that ballooning factor and because i feel like the end is where a lot of these choices should pay off like the idea of having almost like a fractalized, like um, a fractalized ending with like roots going out in all potential directions because you've come to a point where you don't really need to account for the consequences of all those anymore, and so it lets. Uh, I feel like that uh, an ending done well can be the um, the pinnacle of letting the player have that kind of agency and showing where it goes. But it's just something you got to know what you're doing first. Yeah, for sure. Um, Steven? Mistakes uh, or lessons learned? Yeah, it's that you can put a lot of effort into branching that the players won't realize is there. Uh, it's easy to get caught up in the fact that you have sort of a bird's eye view of your story and its structure and like, oh, this is a really interesting choice. And look at this cool side way that they can go. But a player will typically see at most up to one playthrough. Like you, there's no guarantee that they'll even get through, let alone that they'll be like, oh, now I want to go back and see what would be different about it, especially if it's a longer work. And I find myself because I tend to be. Uh, I tend to geek out on structure and interactions. I'm like, oh, this would be a really cool structure. Isn't this neat? Like people just see one line through. Uh, and, and so I sometimes have to rein myself back in and remember that the players, all those quantum states, uh, as you said, sort of collapse down to a story that they experience. Yeah, I ran into that same problem with the coffin maker where I tried to do something very clever where uh, you know, you have a series of choices of the type of, of coffin, but it's it, it's a false choice because uh, the the thing that that differentiates it differentiates the choices is whether you choose a cough any coffin or choose no coffin. Uh, but of course, most people only played through once, and so they didn't see what I was doing with the themes there. And you know, they liked it obviously, but uh, I feel like I, I could have made that more clear. Uh, of course, I only had a thousand words, so uh, I was very constrained. I think it comes down to like people don't quite know always how to read interactive fiction. Like people usually were taught how to read short stories in school, but then like for interactive fiction, it'd probably be like something that an English class would want to teach someone like, okay, you should play it through a couple times to see where the branches go. Sure. I think that's uh, one ad one advantage for sh shorter, uh, for shorter interactive fiction as well, and that's where I've been turning my attention in terms of like being able to have those fractalized endings start to spread out almost immediately, so that it's not a huge investment of time. Because I know that um, like I do have some of those alternate paths in Luminous Underground. They don't show up until the very end, but even then, it's just a case of like I look on Steam, and it's like I see like the the achievements that are associated with uh, get going down those particular paths are like 0.2 or 0.5 percent of players and it's like well at least i'm saying like oh well someone actually found them so at least that's that's a uh, like achievement unlocked like i have been successful in that regard that was something i thought was interesting about uh luminous underground is uh, you know, you've got these choices, but it it very much feels like the way the narrative goes is uh, I inevitable based on what choices you've chosen. And I thought that was that was actually really cool. Like it it felt like a cohesive 
uh, narrative and not like, oh, here's here's a game with a bunch of different like you know red blue options that you can you can choose. I I feel like everybody's not everybody, but the tendency when you're first going to start writing interactive fiction is to end up writing. Uh, what folks call a time cave after the first choose your own adventure book cave of time where it's like every time i choice i branch and so you end up with this big bushy thing and sometimes you know you're at vikings in the past and sometimes you're on spaceships in the future and there's no thematic hole because you just keep sort of banging around and, and making these choices and branching off and it can be hard to prune to bring back together or if you're going to keep that structure have some sort of strong th thematic through line for them all and yeah, I feel like the, to, oh, go ahead. Well, it, it links up to the mistake I was going to talk about, actually. Um, I think this is partially like me as a non-coder finding my way to object-based programming. Um, I kind of like went from that branching decision tree structure to kind of like what I'd call a location-based structure where each geographical spot in the game has like a card and there's like tons and tons of conditionals in each card. And that, that like modifies the place to like, you know, tell the player like what's happening since you left last been here, or if you haven't been here, like here's the description. Um, yeah, it's like kind of almost I'm trying to make like a Skyrim of a text adventure. That's one of the things that I had to sort of adjust to coming from text adventures to choice based fiction, uh, because in text adventures, you know, you're typing and you're interacting with objects and moving around a virtual space. And so you can set up and it tends to be content gated by puzzles. You're going to work through some puzzle to see the next bit of things. So I could come up with mechanics that would in, sort of suggest the kinds of puzzles that you would be experiencing and then use that to build out a story and you build up these systems and then it would just sort of happen. Like I did one where you're like a toddler so your range of motion is you can crawl, you can pull up, you can hold one thing while you're you know, standing up or you can hold two things while you're crawling. Okay, well, now that gives you ways to gate off space and, and possible things that you can't do because of those limitations. Then I got to choice based stories. I'm like, oh, no, anything is possible and I have to write it all. Yeah, that's that that's an interesting difference between, uh, I guess, um, regular games and interactive fiction is that uh, you know, in, 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 in visual games, like you can get stuck because you can't figure out the puzzle or you don't have the, the required skill level. And that's not quite as much a, a thing in interactive fiction. There's always the ability to, to move the, the narrative forward. Um, though I have seen um, counterexamples to that. Um, Ken Liu's How to Build a Dragon at the End of Time in sub Q was very much a puzzle um, text game that did interesting things with the format. And I'll, I'll put a link to that in the Discord. Yeah, I love that one. And I love the way that that plays with the internal and external character arcs um, and, and the idea of reflective choices that Stephen was talking about, about, you know, you can have things change in the narrative or you can have the character change in the narrative. And, and often we want those things to be in lockstep, but you can also separate them out a little bit, which I, I love that story for that reason. Um, yeah, and, and um, you know, a few of us have mentioned structure, and I think that's something that we haven't really explicitly said, but for anybody who is just getting started um, with interactive fiction, I think it's it's important to point out that there are many different kinds of visualizations of structure out there. Um, and, you know, the choice of games model is uh, often called, I think, an arm and fingers, where um, most of your choices don't branch um, massively off from the main narrative until the end. Um, so things are changing, you're having consequences, but you're not going to have an entirely different story. You're not going to go to Narnia in chapter two and never come back um, unless everybody goes to Narnia. So that's one way of doing it. But then you can also have a circular format. Um, you can also have kind of a diamond where you have two pathways that converge. Um, anyone have any other thoughts or, or recommendations about finding those structures? I should shout out. I don't think we've done that yet. <laughs> um, one that I find fascinating and have not done much with is the idea of storylets or quality based stories where you have a bunch of small story elements and 
which ones are available depend on the state of the game and the past choices that the player has made and who is available in the scene. So you can think of it as like a deck of story elements and you keep drawing from that deck and the, the player interacts with it and experiences that story and then that changes what's in the deck and what can be drawn next. Um, like King of Dragon Pass from uh, the 2000s really did a lot with this and is just ro a remarkable game that was way ahead of its time. Um, a lot of the Inkle stuff, the, the around the world in 80 days and somewhere use that kind of structure because then what you can do is write a bunch of bits of content. You're like, okay, these are the kinds of stories and, and events and scenes that will happen towards the end and I can gate them and then I, you know, here are the ones in the middle, here are the ones early and making more content, broadening your story is a little easier because you don't have to be like, all right, I'm going to shove it into this part of the story and then I have to ripple everything forward or back because it's already been gated by other parts of the story. Yeah, I think another um, type of structure that uh, interactive fiction really allows um, that you can't do quite as well in um, regular text fiction is uh, is kind of the looping or repetition repetitious structure. Um, a great example of this uh, just came out um, first times uh, by Nibidiusen, um in Strange Horizons, um, Strange Lust, Strange Loves. Um, uh, uh, issue, and I'll put a link uh, link to that in the chat. Um, and that that did also similar to the marriage uh, variations in Tiny Nightmares did fascinating stuff with um, having the 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 way that the narrative repeats itself, and you go back in time uh, and and redo certain events and and have choices connect to um, uh, the the themes around. Um, losing your virginity. Uh, and one thing I thought that that story did particularly interesting was to subvert that um, uh, ability to, to go back and repeat yourself. And it has actually an interesting thing to say about um, what that ability to go back and repeat yourself does to how you approach situations. So I'd, I'd highly recommend that whole, um, whole issue. Um, uh, there's a lot of good interactive fiction in there. Kate, I think you're muted. You're muted. Oh, sorry. I was just saying my cat banged my laptop. So I think that was her giving me the hook and telling me that the uh, the panel is at an end. Um, so uh, yeah, we can head over to the Discord. Anyone who's able to, um, I'll head over there and we can try to give links to things that we've mentioned. Uh, people have not already dug them up. And um, you can find me on Twitter, Kate Hartfield. I'm doing a reading from my novel, The Embroidered Book, tomorrow here at Flights of Foundry. Can we go around and just say where people can find you? Start with Phoebe. So you can find me on Twitter at a Phoebe Barton, and uh, I'll be doing a, a reading uh, tomorrow at uh, 9 p.m. Eastern. Tenacity? Yes, um, you can find me on Twitter, tenacity underscore flies, and I'm doing a reading tonight. Um, let me double check that time real quick. Yeah, that's 10 p.m. Eastern. It's going to be a story called I Love My AI Son about a marketing executive who creates an AI to model Gen Z teens so we can sell things to them better. But then the robot just calls him cringe instead. Nice. And? Uh, so you can find me at anleblanc.com. Um, I'm also on Twitter at robotleblanc. Uh, and I'll, I'll paste that in the chat because the spelling. Uh, uh, is difficult. Uh, and I'm going to be doing um, a reading tomorrow, uh, Sunday, um, 10 p.m. Eastern. Uh, I'm going to be reading um, a, a Wheel of Cheese in the Valley of the Dead, uh, which involves cheese necromancy and a cheese heist and the worst uh, possible apprentice you could ever have. Hmm. All right, Stephen, bring us home. The easiest way to find me is on Twitter. I am at Sargent, S-A-R-G-E-N-T, as in John Singer, for reasons that are old and nefarious. Um, I've got links to my works there and to my website, which, you know, is my name, but my name is really hard to spell. So just go for at Sargent. All right. 
Thanks very much everybody for a wonderful panel. Thanks to the tech side and thanks uh, attendees for coming and for the, the questions and um, you can find us in the discord. We'll be hanging around. Bye everybody. Thank, thank you for hosting. This was lovely. Thanks for hosting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.